Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Shadow Hunter Blinds, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Indeed, this is the big guy, Mike Avery, and welcome to another edition of the Outdoor Magazine show right here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network. As always, so glad to have you along with us as we continue to work our way through the month of Rocktober. Rocktober, the single best month of the year in my humble opinion. Yes, I love the summertime. I love to be able to go out and chase walleye on Saginaw Bay. I love the springtime because we're chasing uh, turkeys. But there's something about the month of October. All of the hunting seasons have come together. Some great fall fishing as well. Uh, and, of course, the, uh, toward the end of Rocktober, we start to see the whitetail rut. More on that in just a minute. But I don't know what it's been like in your neck of the woods, but we did see our first frost here earlier in the week. Uh, I was out taking my, my early morning walk, and I thought, oh, it's a little brisk. And I realized oh, as I looked at the, uh, the roofs in the neighborhood that there was indeed frost there. Now, what I forgot to do was mark on my calendar when I heard the first cicada. But my recollection, and Pat is telling me, he remembers it as well, the middle of July-ish. Now, how many weeks is that? Well, uh, July, uh, it's almost three months. So maybe the cicadas were not as accurate this year. The old saying was six weeks from the time you hear the first cicada buzz till frost. Well, that was way off. Been keeping track of this for years, and I'm thinking, yeah, it's closer to eight weeks. But this year, it was well beyond that. But, you know, Mother Nature has these patterns, and she has these, oh, systems and things that we have to deal with. And I certainly had to deal with Mother Nature as I was down in Ohio last week. Went down there to hunt with my friend Bill Piles of Ohio Bow Hunting Outfitters. Several of us went down. I think there were 11 of us that were all... What do we call it? Friends of the Outdoor Magazine radio show. We put this outing together uh, during a Wednesday night live, live stream, and a bunch of people who are watching said, yeah, we'd love to go down. Bill Piles was on as well. We put this thing together, and about a dozen of us, 11 of us, spent last week in Ohio uh, with Bill Piles chasing big whitetails down there. We knew that early in the season that it could be tough. The the uh, the traditional October lull. But we didn't expect that the temperatures were going to be so warm. It was 84 degrees one day as I headed out to the stand in the afternoon. Several other days, it was above 80 degrees. And you know that when it's that warm, even in good whitetail country that the daytime activity might be a little bit slow, and it was. We had pictures of big bucks moving during the night on every stand that Bill has set up, but we just weren't seeing the daytime activity. All week long, there was this promise of this big cold front coming in, and we were praying that it would hit midweek because, man, when you've had temperatures that warm and you get a cold front that comes in, you know the bucks are going to become more active during the daytime. Finally, at the end of the week, it did happen. Now, early in the week, one of our hunters, Craig Plowman, in fact, the second day we were there in the morning, shot a real nice buck, and we thought, okay, well, maybe we're going to see some daytime activity. So congrats to Craig. You got to start it off on the right foot, but then it got real, real slow. Uh, my hunts, let's see, I was hunted, uh, I hunted up in some big timber on an oak ridge early in the hunt, uh, saw a few does and fawns, but they're just, again, there was a, two big bucks coming in there during the nighttime, but nothing during the daytime when I was there. So I moved over to a small food plot up on top, um, of a hill uh, overlooking some absolutely beautiful country. I mean, it couldn't have been a, a, a prettier 
place to hunt. One night there, just before dark, I had a beautiful year-and-a-half-old eight-point come in, and he's feeding about five yards from me. But, you know, you don't go to Ohio to shoot a year-and-a-half-old buck. In fact, there with Bill, um, his minimum is a 125-inch buck, and the farm that I started out on at first is a 140-inch buck. That's a big, big buck. At least for me it is. That's a big buck. So you go down there with the mindset that you're going there for something special. Um, and, and what that will be is going to vary from hunter to hunter, right? But we knew we had a 125 inch minimum. Uh, I ended up my hunt down there with Bill on a different property, and that's one of the advantages of hunting with Bill. He's got so many pieces of land he has access to. It was a small food plot tucked in between an ag field and a bedding area. And I, at first, I'll be honest with you, when I sat in here, I thought it feels too open. I don't feel like there's enough cover. But then as I'm sitting there for only about an hour, a, a, a two-and-a-half-year-old buck comes walking into the food plot looking directly at me. He didn't see me, though, but he's walking my direction. I thought, well, this is a good sign, right? He was an interesting buck. He was two-and-a-half, so he had some mass and he had some width, but he didn't have any brow tines. So he was basically a two-and-a-half-year-old four-point. I knew I wasn't going to shoot him, but that was a good sign. And then some does and some fawns filtered into this. They didn't see me at all. They were not spooked at all. So I thought, this is a good spot. I hunted that for the next couple of days, again, waiting for this promised cold front to come in. The last day of my hunt, the cold front comes in. I'm sitting out there in the morning. I'm surrounded by does and fawns. That two-and-a-half-year-old four-point came in to eat again. And then from my left, I see another good-sized buck come sneaking down the trail. He was a a two-and-a-half-year-old eight-point. Again, a beautiful buck, an absolutely beautiful buck, but not what we're in Ohio to take. So we let him go. I came home uh, a little bit early because I had some things I had to take care of. The rest of the hunters stayed in camp, and Scott Gatza, one of our hunters, that last night of the hunt after this cold front had fully rolled through, shot a beautiful 10-point. So congrats to Scott on that. So of the 11 hunters there, only two of them got bucks. But I will tell you, it was one of the most enjoyable hunting experiences I've had in a long time. Uh, uh, For one reason, my son James was able to join us for a few days as well, and that was wonderful. But we had a good group of people. We got along well. And again, everybody there talked about what a fun time it was, even though Mother Nature didn't cooperate. And it pointed out, you don't have to have a harvest. You don't have to kill an animal to have a great buck. So we had a great time. And we're going to do this again next year. I think this is going to become an annual event. uh, event. All right, speaking of bucks, speaking of the rut, my grandson, uh, my granddaughter Addison, 15 year old Addie, shot a beautiful eight point the other night on a piece of property we have leased in uh, mid Michigan. And the thing about that is the buck's neck was big, the tarsal gl- glands were smelly, he was in the rut, and it's not even Halloween yet. How cool is that? So things are starting to pick up, things are starting to turn on. So that's good. That's good news, right? Since we've last talked, there is some bad news as well. And you you are probably aware of this by now, but I haven't had a chance to talk about it because I got word while I was in Ohio that Nick Percy of Killer Food Plots passed away as a result of COVID. This was really, uh, this was a heartbreaker because Nick was a great guy. Nick was one of the good guys. He was like the ever-ready bunny. I mean, this guy had so much energy, and he was so dedicated to helping people enjoy their hunting experiences more fully by helping them develop their property, land management, put in food plots. And he, I don't want to say single-handedly, but he was the driving force behind killer food plots to, to grow it into what it is today. And the potential for that company was unlimited, at least when Nick was here, to be the the spokesperson, and the face of Killer Food Plots. He went into the hospital on his 50th birthday. And I'd been talking to him, texting back and forth. Um, and, and, you know, you, th- you think a guy at that age, yeah, he might get really sick and he might go into the hospital, but you think he's going to make it. 
Well, Nick had an underlying health problem, and he just couldn't recover. And, and the last conversation I had with him and conversations from fellow uh, mutual friends was that he, he kind of knew he was in trouble. I think he kind of knew something was up. So um, prayers for uh, Nick's family, his fiance Tracy, and the entire Killer Food Plots uh, uh, family. Of course, uh, you know, I had a business relationship with him, but I was also a, a, a friend, and I thought the world of him. And, 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 you know, my joke was always with him is, you know, if you give Nick a bag of peanut M&Ms and an unsweetened iced tea from McDonald's, he can go for three days. Turns out that wasn't the case. So, again, prayers to uh, Tracy and the entire uh, Killer Food Plot uh, family, and we will be thinking about them as they continue to work through this situation. Coming up on this week's show, after the break, I want to check in with my friend Bill Piles of Ohio Bow Hunting Outfitters, then Nick Buja of the Michigan Wildlife Council, Keel Jorgensen from Woods and Water News. In hour number two, we're going to head down to Lake St. Clair and talk with Eric Long of Longline Charters. He has been killing the jumbo perch. Joe Dewan of MUCC talking about their AmeriCorps program. This week's Ask Avery segment, what should you tip a guide or a charter captain? And in hour number three... Tom Lounsbury. You know he wants to talk about pheasant hunting, deer hunting, and more, and we'll wrap it all up with wild game chef Dave Miner. So it's a busy show this week. I am so glad you're along with us right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Tawas on WIOS AM and FM, 1480 AM, 106.9 FM. And you can hear us in Port Huron on WPHM, 1380 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Versa Skins. Just change the skin for the season you're in. That's their motto. Versa Skins is high quality hunting gear, a Michigan based family owned company. Uh, company owner Paul Perone came up with an interesting concept. He said, why should you spend big bucks to change out your hunting gear for the different seasons when you could just take a skin and snap it on the outside of that jacket and pants and zip it in, and you can go from white camo to standard camo to blaze orange, and you're covered throughout the entire, entire season. And now they've got big guy sizes, up to like 6X, so they can take care of anybody. Check them out online at VersaSkins.com. That's VersaSkins.com. I took my VersaSkins with me down to Ohio as I was hunting with Bill Piles of Ohio Bow Hunting Outfitters. Um, and unfortunately, it was so warm throughout most of the week, I didn't even get a chance to wear it except for that last morning there in the stand. I told you we had a great hunt in Ohio. Uh, with Bill Piles. Only two bucks were taken out of 11 hunters, but you know what? As I said in the first segment, that's not what hunting is about. Hunting is getting out there, having fun, having a close encounter, possibly, and spending great time in camp with some great people, including Bill Piles, who's with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Bill, welcome back to the show. How are you? Good morning, big fella. How are you? I'm doing great. Listen, Bill, it had been several years since I was down there hunting with you, and the minute I walked back in camp, I realized just how much I had missed it. Oh, see, I was t- trying to tell you for years. You just <laughs> wouldn't <laughs> totally understand. Uh, Bill, you've got a great operation down there. Tell me a little bit about it. Uh, we're fully got in operation this year. Uh, next year will be 25 years. Wow. Uh, this is a full-time business. This is all we do. Uh, and I'm working on, I'm trying to design a machine where I can actually control the weather. <laughs> so other than that, we'll be set for next year. <laughs> now, when you say, when you, when you say fully guided, that doesn't mean you sit in the tr- in the stand with us and tell us which buck we can shoot, right? No, sir. The, the hunters have one job and one job only. That's to make a good shot. That is it. We take care of everything else. All the details are done. You mentioned the weather. Now, we knew when we set the week that early in October that, you know, we, we could have some challenges, but we could have never expected temperatures in the mid-80s. No, not what we have two days of 91. 
<laughs> yeah, two days in 91. Yeah, the heat just, uh, the heat's a killer, especially mid-October, right before that full moon. But we had you know, a little bit of movement, and uh, like you said, the camp was, that camp renewed renewed my faith in humanity for <laughs> groups of hunters. It was a really good time, and it was it was actually relaxing for us. Ah, I'm glad to so hear it that. A, it was a great camp, yeah. We appreciate everything that those guys, the work they put in just as much as we did. Well, and and it's not that the deer weren't there because your cameras were showing a lot of movement of nice bucks during the nighttime. We just we just needed Mother Nature to cooperate to get them up on their feet during the daylight. Yeah, but now they're the past two days have been great. We had one hit last night. We're going after it this morning. He's probably down. So uh, yeah, and then we had uh, several shooters show up last night, and they're still moving this morning. Oh, great! So the weather's. The weather's perfect right now. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for rubbing it in. The old you should have been right. here. You should have been here wanna, next week or last here, week. <laughs> it's an old outfitter's trick. Should have been here yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, listen. The, the the country you're in there. What is it? Knox and Licking counties. I mean, these Knox. things. They're yep, no, Knox and Licking. Yeah, they're known nationally as big buck hotspots. Yeah, I mean, I, Licking is top ten in the nation, which is blows my mind. It's a it's a great county. Knox is not shabby. Uh, yeah, the the counties themselves are two of the top five in the state. People ask me, Avery, you know, you're a you're a big Michigan guy. You love to hunt in Michigan. Why would you Why would you step outside of our state and go down to Ohio? But I think it's good for hunters once in a while to take a little venture and adventure and see what else is out there. Because hunting with you in those hills in central Ohio is not what I'm used to here in Michigan at all. Yeah, people get here and they think uh, some people think we're flat. We're not. I mean, we're not mountainous by any standard, but we're right at the beginning of the Appalachian foothills, so we're starting to get in that rolling country. It's a different, it's a great area. It's, the, the terrain is so different everywhere. Well, some of the hunters would, would argue with you that the, some of the hills they walked up did indeed feel like mountains. <laughs> a couple of them did. <laughs> Nobody complained, though. Nobody no, complained. No, no. And when you hunt those hills, it's something I'm not used to. Is you got to worry about thermals and swirling winds that I, that I don't see here, at least where I hunt in Michigan. Yeah, there's so. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot that goes into it. I mean, hunting. I wish we had some flat stuff. It'd be probably maybe a little easier to hunt. But you know, the wind gets going, the thermals up, thermals down, high in the morning, low in the evening. It's a just a big chess match. Twenty five years next year, Bill. That's that's a tremendous accomplishment because outfitting is not an easy job mentally physically financially it's a it's a rough way to make a living i think it it can be it's it's more of a i'll tell you what as the farther it gets in the season it's all a mental thing i mean you start to you can't you can't let the hunter see you be negative and i i'm a, i've done it several times and sometimes i wish i wouldn't you know vent my frustrations in front of the hunters but yeah so they they know we're just as frustrated as they are and a lot of work goes into this, and if we're not putting deer on the ground, I mean, it's kind of, I don't know, it's not uh, its not as fulfilling as getting ready to go here in about a half hour to look for this. <laughs> well, good luck on that. Um, I, I also find it interesting that when people come into a camp like this, you know, they've got different backgrounds, they've got different <clears throat> expectations, and as you and I talked about when I was down there, they tend to want to bring their way of hunting into your area for example you know they might want to bring all these different scents or these different baits because bait is allowed in ohio my theory on that bill whether i'm bear hunting or whitetail hunting is don't come in and introduce something those critters aren't used to right no it definitely it definitely makes i mean it makes a difference we try to cut you know we try to keep the guys from using scents we use our own scent system uh, we've been using for years uh yeah, and it's just you start introducing new smells and all kinds of new stuff in the woods, and they it's like somebody going in your house and moving your furniture around. You're going to notice as soon as you get up. Yeah. Same thing. They're going to they're gonna notice, and the big boys take notice. How many different stands, and maybe this is a trade secret, I don't know, how many different stands and blinds do you guys have set up? Uh, we're at 148 right now. We just set three new sets yesterday. Uh yeah, I mean, it's just you got to you got to keep moving. There's, sometimes I think we move too much. I don't know if that's a if that's a possibility, but sometimes I think we bounce around too much. But there's just so much area to cover, and yeah, yeah. So the stands, I mean, they're all TMA certified, uh, newer equipment. Uh, no, you know, there's no bicycle seats, 
sitting on a two by four in a tree. They're made to be comfortable. The more comfortable the hunters are, the more successful they're going to be. How do you keep track of that many sets? Uh, I don't know. I can't remember an anniversary, but I can ever I can remember every stand, every color tape, every trail marker. It's insane. Yeah, and that we you know the apps we use on our phone, the, the technology has allowed us to to advance so far. Well, speaking of technology, I see you've converted over almost entirely to, to cellular trail cameras. That's been a huge help for you, hasn't it? Yes, it's a. I mean, that was a, the cameras were a game changer right off the bat, but now, like I said, the technology is so far advanced, and you know, you're in real time. You're in real time. You see it. He's there. It, it, I don't think it helps us in getting on deer like that minute, but it does help to watch that deer a couple of days starts to get into daylight movement and it's time to get in there and hunting so they do help so if you've got cell cameras and you can keep an eye on everything you didn't happen to see me wander around that one stand that morning did you no i didn't say anything (laughs) i didn't want to say anything but (laughs) no everything was good everything was good we have speakers hooked up to them also so i yell at hunters every once in a while Uh, uh, wake up get off your cell phone (laughs) yeah Lori, get off your phone Put down the iPad, Lord. <laughs> where do most of your hunters? Where do most of your hunters come from, Bill? Uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, East Coast, New York, Vermont. Uh, a lot of East Coast draw. We have a few from out west, but it's a we're a huge draw for the East Coast. I mean, instead of driving to Kansas and Iowa, you know, tw- what twenty hours, fifteen hours from the East Coast, you're driving six or seven to here. That we have the same same quality deer. Uh, there's just as many of them. Uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a closer drive in the East Coast is a big draw for us. First time Michigan hunters who come down with you, what what is their reaction? I mean, they've got a, they've got a certain expectations, but once they've spent a couple of days with you, what what's the experience like for us Michigan guys? I don't know, spending a couple of days with me, boy. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> You've experienced that a few times. <laughs> yes, it's, a, I have. it's. A, I mean, they just have to have, and they have to have real world expectations when they get here. There's not a 160 inch deer behind every tree. You just have to have realistic expectations when you come. Just like when you leave your house up there, you have to be realistic. I mean, you can't kill big deer if they're not there. We have big deer, uh, and if they're patient and just, you know regarding the weather and stuff i can't control that so if they just have real world expectations when they get here it's everything is good we fully intend to come back next fall and do another uh outing like we did this year but what about the rest of the season bill if somebody's heard me talk about you and they say hey i want to go down and give it a try do you have anything open yet this year at all i have uh we had three cancellations for rut hunts uh, November 8th through the 12th and Ooh. November 15th through the 19th. Ooh. So we do have three spots that opened up. I have been down there in November, and on the right day, it can be uh, magic. Pretty special. Yeah. It can be pretty special. Yeah, yeah and it's and our rut has been really good the past four or five years without that trickle effect. It's been nonstop, you know, not a couple hours here and a couple hours there, and then they lay down for half a day, but it's been nonstop. So it, the rut for the past three or four years have been really, really good. I was really encouraged that last morning I sat in the stand. It was like somebody, you know, the temperature dropped 15 degrees and it was like somebody flipped a switch. Light switch. Oh, yeah. man, it's it was crazy. amazing. Amazing. You live for stuff like that in October. Oh, absolutely. Bill, listen, I appreciate yeah. you um, helping to put this uh, event together and for hosting us and for letting us come down. I'll send people to your website, OhioBowHuntingOutfitters.com, OhioBowHuntingOutfitters.com. Good luck finding this buck you're looking for this morning and good luck the rest of the season. Thank you, Mike. All right. Bill Piles of Ohio Bow Hunting Outfitters. Again, the website, OhioBowHuntingOutfitters.com. I ha- he said next year's the 25th anniversary. I hunted with Bill, gosh, like the f- first or second year he was in business. When I had the TV show, we used to go down there every year, multiple times a year. I kind of got burned out on deer hunting, and I think the TV show kind of spoiled me on deer hunting. I got out of it for a while. Uh, now getting back into it here in Michigan, thought we would head down, take a bunch of people down to Ohio, and we had a great, great time. Great people, great camp, great country, great outfitter. Bill Piles of Ohio Bow Hunting Outfitters, OhioBowHuntingOutfitters.com. We'll take a break. When we come back, Nick Bougie of the Michigan Wildlife Council, then Keel Jorgensen from Woods and Water News.
can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Alpena on WZTK 105.7 FM and in Lansing on WILS 1320 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Boning Archery. Michigan-based boning has been a leader in the archery industry since 1946, and that means this is their 75th anniversary. How cool is that? Uh, boning continues to be a, a leader and continues to innovate with uh, products for target archers and bow hunters alike. Check them out online at boning.com. That's B-O-H-N-I-N-G.com. 75 years. Think about that. The company's been around since uh, Fred Bear was out in the early days of promoting archery. That is a tremendous accomplishment. Speaking of promoting archery and the outdoors and the outdoor lifestyle and hunting and fishing and shooting and trapping, uh, the folks at the Michigan Wildlife Council, that is their goal. That's why they were formed a few years ago, to protect and preserve and promote our outdoor heritage. Nick Buja is uh, the chairman of the Michigan Wildlife Council and also an avid outdoorsman. He's with us on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Nick, once again, you drew the short straw, my friend. No, it's, it's always a privilege <laughs> to be on. I appreciate it. So, Nick, how, how's your season going? Have you had a chance to get out and do much hunting? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I've gotten up to the UP a few times to, to do some grouse hunting. Um, I, I haven't got uh, out in the bow stand yet, but I did give I did give sharp tail a try in the eastern UP. I know we talked about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, earlier this year, and I can't say I've crossed it off my bucket list, but I can confirm that they that they do have sharp tail in the UP. So we ran into some, but I, I haven't been able to cross it off the bucket list yet. So so did you know? right away i mean did, did there's something that the dogs did that you knew you were on sharp tail or did you have to flush them to see them or how did you know it wasn't a, a just a, a rough grouse yeah so i mean it's completely different habitat um sharp tails live and really if you go up in the eastern up there's a bunch of half land and it's it's really just hay fields and alfalfa so kind of like out west um they 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 don't want they don't want to be around trees like uh, like a rough grouse does. So you're really just walking through a hay field. More like pheasant habitat. Yeah. Yep. Huh. Well, it's 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 good to know that they're there. I didn't I didn't really know we even had a population uh, of sharp tails in Michigan. And isn't that part of what the Michigan Wildlife Council is about? Is educating people to what we have here in our state. Yeah. No. That's that's exactly. Um, you know, what, what we've been trying to do, and I think for years uh, you've seen ads on, on a lot of non-game species like peregrine falcons and sandpipers and things like that. And, you know, last this summer we, we focused, uh, we kind of came out with a new campaign with a girl named Annette, um, and, and she was, you know, kind of decked out in, in fishing gear and really promoted the, you know, the economic benefits of fishing. And now that we're moving into the fall, it's going to kind of be the first time we see, you know, I'll, I'll say hunters represented more, more directly. Where she'll be in and dressed like a hunter in in a tree stand and kind of talking about the uh, the economic benefits that that we that sportsmen have. I mean, we contribute billions to Michigan's economy. Um, you know, one of my trips to the UP, we went with a group from Indiana, and they go every year and. Um, you know, it's it's they go out to eat dinner every night. They stay at hotels. They buy gas, and then obviously the purchase of their license that that goes back to to fund conservation. So, um, be, between all all the trips that that hunters and anglers do every year, um, it's it's quite a boost to the Michigan economy. That's an not in, just conservation. That's an interesting point because even if somebody here in Michigan is not a hunter or angler. You know, they should be aware that what we're doing is not only biologically sound and biologically necessary and part of our history and tradition to many of us, but it's an economic factor as well. That's a good point, Nick. Yep. Hmm. So the website is here for miOutdoors.org, here for miOutdoors.org. In a couple of minutes we got left. Switch hats for me. You're also part of another group. Help me out. The Congressional... Uh, uh, Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. Tell me more about that, Nick. Yeah, so we are uh, a 501c. We're a nonprofit. We were started about 30 years ago 
to help the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, which is the largest bipartisan caucus in D.C. Um, and then from there, we kind of realized that a lot of these um, decisions were being made at the state level as far as wildlife management and conservation decisions. So we started the National Association of Sportsmen's Caucuses. We've got 49 states. Um, every state except for Hawaii has a sportsman's caucus. Um, Hawaii does have a fishing caucus, but we're, we're, we're working on that. Um, and so basically we, we work with uh, Congress, state legislators, and we also have a governor's caucus. Um, to promote hunting, fishing, trapping, and, and sports shooting. You've got your hands in a lot of things these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and Michigan, you know, Michigan is, uh, I'd say, probably one of our stronger caucuses. And, and there's a lot there's a lot going on this fall that, that sportsmen and women should be aware of. So, Well, listen, let's, let's stay in touch, and you'll keep us informed on that. And my hope for you is you can get out in the tree stand here real soon. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, Nick, appreciate your time. Nick Bougia right. of the Michigan Wildlife Council, the website here for miOutdoors.org, here for miOutdoors.org. The only guy I think I know who has hunted sharp tails, no, probably, I think Al Stewart. I think I talked with Al Stewart, now retired DNR wildlife biologist Al Stewart, about sharp tail in Michigan. But I always thought they were a western bird, so it's cool to know that we have them here as well. We'll take a break here on the Outdoor Magazine Show. When we come back, Keel Jorgensen. Now, that might not be, you might not recognize his name. Usually we have uh, Tom Campbell on or Keel's dad, Randy Jorgensen. So he's second generation there at Woods and Water News. We'll talk about that and more after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Traverse City on WTCM. That's 580 AM. You can hear us in Sandusky on WMIC AM and FM. That's 660 AM, 95.3 FM. And you can hear us north of the bridge in the Sioux on ESPN 1400 WKNW. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by MUCC's On the Ground program. OTG is a program to improve uh, habitat for fish and wildlife across the state. For details, check out the Michigan United Conservation Club's website. It's MUCC.org, MUCC.org. And a reminder, if you want to save 25% on your MUCC membership, either signing up for the first time or your renewal, Use the promo code MIKE at that website, MUCC.org. Promo code MIKE, all caps, M-I-K-E, and you will save 25%. How cool is that? Uh, I also think it's cool when I see multi-generational, Michigan-based, outdoor-related companies. And right now I'm thinking Woods and Water News, Michigan's premier outdoor publication. Woods and Water News was basically started by Randy Jorgensen. Now, you hear me talk with Tom Campbell here on the show a lot. Tom has been intimately involved in a big part of that growth as well. These days, Randy's son, Keel, is also involved in the operation, the publication, and he's with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Keel, welcome. How are you? Doing great, Mike. Thanks so much. Hey, listen, it's a pleasure. Uh, So now the big outdoor weekend is behind you. Uh, it looked like it was a rousing success. Now it's what? Back to the, the the grind of putting out monthly publications. Back to the grind of putting out monthly publications and are already planning for 2022. Yeah, it's uh, the show was a, a success and, you know, we were happy to get through it and have everybody back and see familiar faces and new faces and seeing families back in there. And it was great. We're, we're you know, we were happy we could be able to put it on. Keel, you grew up around the organization i mean it's always yeah. been a part of your of your life did you know right away that this is where you wanted to end up or is did, did life throw you some kind of a curveball say hey i want to go back to the family business nope i knew from the get-go it's always been my passion you know i got to see my dad and my uncle uh build it from the ground up and it's something that's always interested me and you know and those guys are great role models to me and and uh, i'm just hoping to keep passing it on i, I love it it's, i have a blast with it too so do you, I would suspect that you, 
look at this from a little bit different perspective. Whereas your dad and your uncle, you know, Randy and Tom, yeah. uh, look at it from where I would look at it, you know, from one generational perspective. I wonder if you look at this and go, geez, how can we use technology? How can we use social media? How can we, whatever it is. I mean, you, do you bring that to the table? Yeah, I, I do my best to. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously with, with Perennial, you got to evolve. Um, there's no doubt about that. You don't do it, you're, you're going to stay stagnant. So, I mean, we hit our social media hard, our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, our website, you know, and then our OutdoorWeekend.net site. So we're trying to stay heavily involved in uh, the digital side of the outdoors as well as just the print. And we're always building on that, too. I mean, with our articles and advertisers, our tips, or everything we got in there is, is doing great. Um, but there's no doubt we got to keep evolving. Do you think there will ever be a day when there won't be a print version of the magazine, or is it just so darn popular it's always going to be the bread and butter? It's always going to be the bread and butter. I mean, you know, one one big thing nowadays, everyone loves is nostalgia, right? I mean, you can your honey camp, a lot of people don't have service. you got your issue there. You can pass it around. It stays around the table. And, um, you know, give it to your buddies, your family, friends, whatever. And uh, I, I think, I really, truly believe it's going to be around. I, you know, I agree with you. You can't go into a hunting camp or you can't go into a guy's trophy room or, or a family room or anything like that that there's not a copy or several copies of Woods and Water News. Sure. Sure. That's cool to think about. It, it is. And you're continuing that tradition, and I, I, I think that's very cool. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. What's coming up in this uh, next edition, Keel? Yeah, November issue is on stands now. Um, what we're doing is it's hitting, obviously. Hunting is king. A lot of hunting. Um, Adam Lewis has got a great one out on page 14, tackling the rut. Um, you know, we got some fall fishing, some kayaking stuff, um, uh, pheasant. You know, we're, we're hitting a lot this month, but there's no doubt it's heavily um, deer hunting uh, issue, being the November one. And uh, it's no, out right now, yeah, so go yeah. pick it up. Yeah, no, November has to be primarily deer yeah. hunting. Has to be. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And where do we find it, Kiel? You can find it anywhere. You can find it at any of your local uh, party stops, your favorite stops. Um, you know, you can always subscribe online or off our Facebook, call us in. But, yeah, we're, we're all over the place, Mike. Um, and you can get a subscription to the print version. Now, yep. d- does the e-version, the electronic version, automatically come with a print subscription or, or vice versa, I mean? You, you can get a combo. You can get a combo. You can get if you if you're one just into digital and just want it on your phone or on your on your tablet or your computer, you can do that as well. But you know, for the print, it's only twenty nine dollars for the year. Ah, yeah. Well, money money well spent. And and for details on that, the website woods n waternews dot com. That's correct. All right, Keel. Appreciate your time. Uh, keep up the good work, and we'll talk again. Thank you so much, Mike. Keel Jorgensen, uh, second generation there at Woods and Water News. I think Michigan's premier outdoor publication, and that's saying a lot because Michigan is well-known, as we are for so many things in the outdoors, right? We are well-known for having a long history and tradition of this outdoor lifestyle for a lot of companies that uh, are based around the outdoors and the outdoor industry. Um, And you know what? Print publications have come and gone. And to keep uh, a magazine as viable and as popular as Woods and Water News has, that's a big deal. woods and waternewscom We'll take a break for the top of the hour. When we come back at hour number two, we're heading down to Lake St. Clair or up to Lake St. Clair, depending on where you're listening. Checking in with Eric Long of Long Line Charters, then Joe Dewan of MUCC, and uh, this week's Ask Avery segment. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by J Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Shadow Hunter Blinds, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to hour number two of this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network, here from the Outdoor Magazine radio studio. 
Again, I say radio because that's what this show is designed to be. It is scheduled, recorded, produced, distributed primarily as an outdoor radio show, a syndicated statewide outdoor radio show. And I I continue to push that because that's what makes this product, this program, unique. There aren't many syndicated outdoor radio shows out there. And I do take some pride in the fact that this is Michigan's biggest outdoor radio show. Uh, And I think the best way to listen to the program, if you can, is on your local radio station. You get your local news, weather, sports, local commercials. Maybe there's a sale you want to take advantage of. Plus, the broadcast stations get the content of the show before the podcast is made available. But isn't it good to know that there is a podcast version of the Outdoor Magazine radio show uh, to listen to if your local affiliate doesn't carry all three hours of the show or if you live in some part of our state not covered by the broadcast footprint, the broadcast signal of the show. Where do you hear that? You can hear it on my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. You can hear it on my Facebook page. It's on Amazon Music. It's on Audible, Twitter, LinkedIn, iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Player FM, Deezer, Odyssey, and even on YouTube. Isn't that crazy? I put I put a podcast up on YouTube, and people watch slash listen to it there. As long as I'm doing some blatant self-promotion, I also do monthly podcasts for several companies, including... Uh, Jay's Sporting Goods, the most recent Jay's podcast, features a, an interview with uh, the Poet family uh, celebrating their 50th anniversary. I also do podcasts for Offshore Tackle, Angler Quest Boats, Polar Craft Boats, Shadow Hunter Blinds, a quarterly podcast for Michigan Out of Doors, MUCC. And I had been producing monthly podcasts as well for Killer Food Plots. Uh, since we've last talked, though... Um, the man behind Killer Food Plots, Nick Percy, has passed away as a result of COVID. Way, way, way too young. So, uh, of course, the future of that um, project is kind of on hold for right now. And I would ask you, if you are a praying person, to pray for uh, Nick's fiance Tracy, and the entire Killer Food Plots family, because his uh, passing has left a big hole in their uh, lives for sure. Um, what is it? It's October. It's Rocktober, right? Which means uh, great, great hunting. All of the hunting seasons are open right now. At least I think so. Yeah, all the hunting seasons are open. But let's not forget about some great fall fishing as well. If you want to get out and catch a bunch of fish or trophy fish, this is a great time of year to do it. Eric Long knows that very well. He spends the entire summer out there on Lake St. Clair, and he spends much of the fall out there on Lake St. Clair. In fact, the other day, and I I haven't posted this yet, I forgot to, he sent me a very, very impressive of two people holding a giant Lake St. Clair sturgeon that they caught while trolling. I've never heard of that before. I think this morning he's out there on a perch charter, but he is uh, gracious enough to... uh, to give us some time, and I appreciate it. Eric, welcome back to the show. Appreciate you being with us. Good morning, Mike. So what are you doing this morning? You, you perching or you just after something else? No, we're perch fishing. We're out here in Gross Point area, just kind of picking away at them. I think we got 100 or so. <laughs> just, <And we're, laughs> I mean, we're, it's been pretty good. The perch fishing in St. Clair is probably, over the last few years, have been, you know, it's coming back. It was pretty dead there for a little bit, but now it's uh, it's pretty on par with like you know your lake here you saginaw bay i think honestly it's better than saginaw bay right now well when i hear you say you're just picking away at him i didn't expect you to have you say you caught about 100 100 fish that's a pretty good morning <laughs> yeah i think we're, we're almost there we got five of us in the boat now so i think we're just picking away at our last 25 and what's the size any jumbos uh, uh eight to twelve nothing nothing over 12 today but a lot of 8 to 12s, a lot of 8 to 10s, really. Well, and, and that term jumbo perch, that's very subjective. I mean, one person's jumbo is not necessarily another person's jumbo. Yeah, I mean, I would say anything over 12 inches is probably a jumbo. That's when they start kind of looking goofy and their head looks a lot smaller than their body type thing. <laughs> Those are the kind you want to find, eh, Eric? Oh, yeah, that's what we're searching for. They're starting to move in. You know, we're, the water's just now hit 
59 degrees last Thursday. It was 69. So we oh, dropped geez. 10 degrees over about five days. And, wow. you know, we were out in 17, 18 foot of water. Now we're 14 to 16 foot of water just fishing little weed beds. But they're starting to move in. We're not, like, schooled up like they are in the winter months, per se. But they're uh, we just kind of move around, hit a weed bed, catch a few, move around, you know, just kind of keep moving. The fact that Lake St. Clair is so shallow, does the water temp change quickly or because it's constantly flowing through there does it is it not uh does it not change from day to day i mean it depends on where you're at in the lake you know if you're at the south end of the lake or you're up on sinkler shore shore it's going to vary a lot faster than it would near the channel the channel's more consistent water time. so i bet that honestly the channel's probably almost warmer right now just because it's a little bit deeper and it's a little more consistent. But we're in, like I said, 14 to 16, and it's, I like guess, dropping fast. So I'm at, probably this time next week, we're probably looking at low to mid-50s. And do you like that in the fall? Do you like to see that water temp drop? Oh, yeah. It's going to bring out, you know, we're going to have real good walleye fishing here pretty quick. And obviously, the perch fishing is going to continue. So what's the secret? You started to tell me, and I think I interrupted you. What's the secret to finding perch on Lake St. Clair? I mean, right now, movement, but, uh, you know, we got areas that we fish. Pretty much, if you're fishing anywhere from, like, the Crocker launch up there and, there, and all the way down through Girls Point, and that 14 to 16 foot of water, you just got to find weeds. Like, this time of year, a lot of weeds are dying, so we're looking for weeds on the bottom there, you know, that 6 to 12 inch tall weed, and just kind of, you know, bounce around until you find areas that are holding fish, and they keep moving. You know, we've been consistently in the same area, though, the last week, which is nice. Boating traffic down now? Have the recreational boaters called it quits for the season? <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, that's actually the pretty because where we're fishing right now, we're kind of near St. Clair Shore. So if there was if there was recreational traffic, it would suck bad. But I'm looking around us right now. We probably got at least 50 perch boats within sight. So I mean, all the <laughs> all the perch guys are out here. That the word is out. The perch are biting. That's for sure. Yeah, that's because you keep posting pictures on social media. <laughs> well, there, it's not just me, but yeah, I'm sure it doesn't hurt. No, it's 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 no secret about Lake St. Clair, is it? No, and it, I mean the locals have known about this for years you know and it's a good area to fish it's just the problem is the only problem about lake st Clair is you get limited access in the fall as far as boat ramps you know all the private ramps pretty much shut down you got a couple of the uh, public ramps that stay open hmm. i so didn't that know does, that you know yeah so that does kind of hurt you like nine miles shuts down and there's a there's a, there are a couple of private launches in St. Clair Shores for residents only. So pr- pretty much in the fall, you got to bank on St. Jean down by the River Mouth or Alter Road, but they close too at some point. So you got like the DNR launches, Crocker and uh, Harley are generally the closest to the walleye and perch grounds. What's your setup for perch? Are you using just standard perch rigs like we could buy anywhere, or you got you got some secrets you're tying up on the no, end there? No, we got nothing too crazy. Honestly, less is more. We have, I've tried some of those fancy rigs with the flies and different colors and whatnot, and basically some of our most productive rigs are we just tie them up ourselves. My buddy Paul ties them up. It's pretty funny, but they're uh, – just standard hooks. I mean, we got chrome bead, clear bead, and then like nothing on it. Just a little perch spreader with uh, just a plain hook on it with a minnow. And that's it. It seems less is more has been because the water gets so clean out here. It's not like you're sagging all but Lake Erie where you're fishing in, you know, two, three foot of visibility. We can see down 10 feet right now almost. So. See, that drives me crazy. I am not used to fishing that crystal clear water. And when I run into that, I, it throws, I, I don't know where to start. I mean, how, how do you catch a fish in 13 feet of water when you can see them? You know they can see you. <laughs> oh, yeah. You just keep moving. Like right now, like the sun's up, bluebird skies, and they're kind of shutting down. So what I'm doing right now is I'm actually jogging back and forth. So I got spot. We're fishing out of the smaller boat, so we were able to spot lock it so basically i'm just jogging back and forth 15 20 feet at a time and we're almost not even jigging it so you find the bottom hold it off the bottom two or three inches and then that kind of when the boat jogs it drags that bait across them and that's when we're picking them up right now ah okay i see what you're doing you're it, you, it's it's almost like a modified back troll or something like that where the bait is oh, yeah. actually not right below the boat no, it's like, it's kind of below the boat, but we're we're moving, so it's not like it. It just it seems like that sideways presentation of that bait will start triggering them up a little bit better. Huh. Uh, any secret on the minnows, or just standard perch minnows? Uh, whatever we can get, we were getting like these mud minnows for a while, and they were working. Um, about two weeks ago, the bite was actually a little bit better, which is weird. The water was seventy five degrees, and we were we were getting them in twelve feet of water. It was really weird. But now we're we got emeralds right now, which is nice. So the local bait shops are starting to get emeralds, and we're using those. That's so like I the mean, that's like, like the old standby for perch, right? Emeralds, emerald yeah, or blue yeah. shiners. 
Yep, pretty much. Yeah. And that's their, that's kind of what they're foraging for down here anyway, is their local caught. And, you know, we're just basically putting what they're naturally biting in the water. So We're talking with Eric Long of Long Line Charters. He's out on a perch charter on, Sag- uh, Sag- on uh, Lake St. Clair this morning as we are talking, but Eric also targets uh, smallies, he targets muskies, he targets walleye as well. And we'll talk about that fall fishery after the break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. Uh, Eric's website is longlinecharters.com. That's longlinecharters.com. I think he will be out there until the ice forces him off, and maybe he'll be out there during ice fishing season as well. We'll find out about that and more after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. And also, uh, Joe Dewan of MUCC coming up talking about their uh, AmeriCorps program. And this week's Ask Avery segment addresses the question, what do you tip a hunting guide or a charter captain? That's all coming up in hour number two of Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Battle Creek on WBCK, that's 95.3 FM. And you can hear us in Cairo on two stations, WKYO, 1360 AM, and WIDL, 92.1 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by the Linwood Beach Marina and Campground. Linwood Beach can be your year-round Saginaw Bay fishing destination and your mid-Michigan Tracker and Angler Quest headquarters. For more info, check them out online at linwoodbeachmarina.com. That's linwoodbeachmarina.com. If you need uh, your boat winterized, if you need it covered, if you need it stored, Linwood Beach Marina is your place. If you're looking for uh, a jumping off place for Saginaw Bay fall waterfall hunting, Linwood Beach Marina is your place. If you're looking for fall fishing access, Linwood Beach Marina is your place. And looking forward to ice fishing season, uh, a great jumping off point as well. LinwoodBeachMarina.com is the website, LinwoodBeachMarina.com. Moving from Saginaw Bay down to Lake St. Clair, Eric Long of Longline Charters, LongLineCharters.com, is on Lake St. Clair as we are recording this week's show. He's out there on a perch charter. And Eric, how's it going this morning? Uh, it's going good. I mean, we're, like I said, we're over 100 by now so we're just kind of picking away at them now we just while we were on break we did make a decent move here so now we're back on them again so Hmm. it's good there is uh i mean listen i love the troll but there's something about having that rod in your hand i don't care if it's a walleye or perch or whatever there's something about having that rod in your hand when the fish bites isn't it oh yeah i mean our favorite time to fish is april may june on the detroit river you know we're down there you know it's pretty much all we do is jig then we do a little bit of trolling a little bit of bottom bouncing but it's mostly vertical jigging uh this time of year how long will you stay at it are you right out there till it ices up well i am and i'll be in until the marina and tells me i can't be in any longer so this year i'm putting the uh, center council in so basically so i'm in and i'm hoping to stay in past thanksgiving so we'll see and and you, you still going to be after perch then, or going to switch over to something no, else? No, I mean, well, I mean, we can perch fish. I, I mean, usually start in November. I go back to walleye trolling. So perch fish in October, walleye trolling because like November, October can be a tough time to troll. There's a ton of weeds out here. All the weeds die, and it's really hard time to pull boards out here with the floating weeds. And mm-hmm. It's like it's nonstop clearing baits. So it's, it can be frustrating. So usually October perch, and then November when the weeds are like not really in the system no more, we go back to crankbaits and we're trolling. Speaking of trolling, though, I saw a picture uh, from you uh, a little while ago that was very, very impressive with that sturgeon. Tell me about that. Yeah, it was, it was a funny day because it was right before that. We were trolling along the Canadian trail line over there, and uh, it was like flat calm, and there was gar pikes sunning themselves everywhere. And we're like... All right, look at all these garp like, and the clients are all like looking at them. And they're they're all you know, it was pretty cool. So they're and they're big. So we're looking at them. We're like, do you? They're like, do you catch those? And we're like, no, we never catch those on crankbaits ever. Five minutes later, we catch a garp like on a crankbait. We're like, what the heck's going on? <laughs> so we get that in the boat. No sooner than we do we do is we put it back. We're talking about oh, the next thing we got to do is we got to catch a muskie. And then uh, a board goes flying back, and we're trolling inline boards for walleye, basically like walleye and bass. And the board goes flying back, and all of a sudden the sturgeon launches out of the water. I'm like, oh, well, it's not a muskie. Wow. So we we, uh, we pull all the rods in because we had, I think we only had like four or five boards in at that time. So we ended up pulling all the boards in, and we actually backed the boat up. It was on the 31 footer, so we just you know we backed up to it and 
and it was a, not a terribly long fight because we were able to, you know, reel in to it. You know, we went up and caught back up to it. It was pretty funny, though. It was a good time. Well, I mean, and, and that was... And they don't bite, you know. Like, yeah, unfortunately, it was foul hooked, you know. So it, it was right on, like, the side of the face, kind of. So then, basically, we got it to the boat. And see, that, the yeah, see, that was my question. I'm thinking, they're bottom feeders. What are they doing hitting a crank? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever been on St. Clair, but if you're out on a calm day and you just look across the horizon, at any given time, you're going to see fish jumping. It's just, those sturgeons seem like they jump out of the water all day long. So they like they'll sit on the bottom and then they launch out of the water for whatever reason, <laughs> and you, you can watch them. So I'm sure it was just like it was swimming through the water column, and then you know the, it was a bandit crankbait and just flew into the side of his face. You know what what a what a tremendous fishery you have there on Lake St. Clair. Yeah, I mean it's you just never know what you're going to catch. Typically, it's a four to six species day. Like because we used, we don't really call them walleye trolling trips. I mean we do them. Or, May and June, we can do walleye, and then November, we can target walleye exclusively for the most part. But during the summer, it's like whatever bites, you know, and even any given day, you're going to catch walleye, bass, pike, muskie, you know. We were, we caught catfish last time. We caught a sturgeon on the same trip. We caught that gar pike, and you're like, and during the summertime, we run, we're running a spoon spread, and we're, we're dragging in perch all summer, too. We're getting like 10 or 12 jumbo perch. Uh, on a on a walleye trip or a mixed bag trip, really. Well, I, I know you like to call them mixed bag trips, but but muskies. I mean, when I think of Lake St. Clair, I think that that is a world class musky fishery. Are there days when you go out and and target? I mean, you're looking for muskies. Oh yeah, we do musky trips. Do we do exclusive musky trips, or we do like a combo? The combo stuff basically is walleye tackle. With, it's you know the same stuff you're using on Saginaw Bay, except for running a thirty pound mono leader. So that we don't get, you know, the chance of getting bit off is less. But musky fishing, we just, you know, we upsize everything. And typically we're going to be in Canadian water. So the musky fishing for us has been slow the last few years because Canada just finally opened up for us to fish. And uh, I believe it was the last week of July this year. So, you know, we, we didn't, uh, we pushed back like it was like two years of no musky trolling for the most yeah. part because the U.S. waters for trolling is not as good as the Canadian side. You know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, when Canada opened up, that's what allowed me to go to Ontario on my bear hunt. But it also allowed you guys to get into Canadian water and, and get after those fish. And that must have been a nice relief after not having access for a while. Yeah, in the summertime, like, we have adapted to the summertime fishery on Lake St. Clair without going to Canada. I mean, we, like I guess I'd be doing a lot more of those multi-species trolls. And it, it, those are fun because they're active. You're getting 30, 40 bites a trip. You know, you're getting enough walleye to take home to eat. You know, you're typically getting six to ten walleye during the summer months, and then you're getting a bunch of bites mixed in. But it, what it really affected us was the springtime when we on Detroit River. You know, the Detroit River, like 90% of the time, we want to be in Canada. Just because of prevailing winds, the stained water, and then the fishery, it's just they have more natural shoreline. The fish are going to spawn over there and just have more fish. So when you can't go to Canada and you have everybody on one side of the river and that side of the river is not as productive, it does get difficult. Uh, do you do ice ice fishing trips as well? No, I just go to Florida. I spend all my <laughs> ice fishing money on plane tickets. Yeah, I, I refer all my ice fishing trips to Captain Mark up in Saginaw Bay. I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. I don't like being cold. Yeah, well, and you do spend. I, I say, now that you mentioned, I see a lot of uh, social media posts from you guys in Florida fishing saltwater in the in the winter time. Yeah, I mean, I'd much rather be doing that. I mean, the, and the end goal is to split time at some point. You know, I'm still working on it, but I have enough connections over there that I can hopefully do it pretty soon. So we'll. Uh, We'll see. Now, remind me, remind me, are you still, are, are you, are you chartering basically part-time with a, with a full-time job on the side or are you doing just fishing now? I mean, no, I'm still doing both. I mean, it's basically a full-time job for me now, but it's still my second job, if that makes any sense. So oh, I does, have my brother working for me. My brother, Dave, he uh, got his captain license. So we got him another boat last year. He's got a 23 foot bay boat and he helped me out a ton on the river. So he fished a lot of April, May, June, and he's got a second job too, but he took time off. So we, we, you know, we do a ton of trips April, May, June. We probably did 130 trips this spring between two boats. And then I run the two boats in the summer. I got the 23 footer and the 31. So, so is it an either or thing or are there, or are there days when the big boat and the smaller boat are both out there? Uh, no, it's just usually either or. Honestly, the, the little boat's been going out of the water about 1st of July. I've been pulling it out. And I've just been doing uh, the 31, basically, July until the fall. And then November, I usually put the small boat back in. So it just kind of, like, collects, you know, collects dust in the pole barn. I took it over to Ludington this year. We did a, 
I did a week of fishing over there. That was pretty fun. You know, of course, it rained every day and blew, but we still caught a decent amount of fish. Uh, what what a what an interesting change that would be from going from that extremely shallow water of Lake St. Clair, the warm shallow water of Lake St. Clair, over to the cold deep water of Lake Michigan. Yeah, it's it's definitely good. It's good to get a little change, though. I mean, like Lake St. Clair is a great fishery, and then we, you know, obviously we appreciate having it in our backyard. But it is nice to do something a little bit different, a little change of pace, mix it up for me. Yeah, I, I, going back to your concept of these multi-species trips, I love that because I got to believe your average charter. A client just wants to catch fish. They don't really care what it is. And if you throw in enough walleye to take home and eat, it's the best of all worlds. Yeah, for the most part. And then summertime, you know, like the spring's a little bit different for us. It's all your hardcore guys and a lot of guys that want to eat fish. And, you know, we have Simbad's restaurant, which is around the corner. They're cooking up their walleye after their catch. In the summertime, it's just people want to go out and enjoy the sun, be warm, and catch fish. So, I mean, it's it's a different clientele in the summer for the most part. Your spring and your fall guys are your hunters and your fishermen, and in the summertime is a lot more of your families. When will you hit the Detroit River in the springtime? As soon as Mother Nature lets you? Yeah, we're typically in there fun fishing the last week of March. I don't run trips until the first week of April typically just because you just never know. The weather's so unstable. But I'll, my boat's usually in the water the last week of March, and then that's when all the buddies get to come out of the, the woodwork and go out and you know get free trips for a week, and then uh, <laughs> and then April first they just it, you know it's, I don't have time to take any friends fishing anymore, so they just you know hop on and usually it's early March. You know I'll start trying to hit like Lake Erie with some buddies, you know, and maybe a little bit of Saginaw Bay, maybe troll Lake St. Clair if it's open. But last week of March in the river for sure. You talk about the weather. That's that's an interesting part of uh, of doing what you do as a captain. You can't. I mean, you're you're dealing with what eventually will become your full time job, your livelihood, and you don't have control over all the factors. You're fighting fish, and you're fighting weather, and you're fighting Mother Nature. Oh yeah, that's that's one of the reasons we got a big boat. I mean, my twenty three footer will do everything. The center console. It's a nice boat. It's got an onboard head. You know, it's a T top. I can do everything on it, but it's a twenty three foot boat, and that's why we got the thirty one. So on St. Clair, on, we can basically fish day in and day out for the most part because a lot of the trips in the summer are trolling trips. So like when we can go to Canada, when that's open, typically unless the wind's blowing a ton, we can either find we can find a shoreline somewhere that we can fish. All right, if I send people to your website, longlinecharters.com, do you have openings for this fall, Eric? Um, Yeah, you're going to want to contact me direct. But, yeah, they, my number's on there, my contact information's there. And they, I have... I'm booked up until the first week of November right now, but I'm gonna start. I'm gonna run probably two or three weeks of walleye trips in November. Excellent. Yeah, I don't like giving out phone numbers, but if they go to the website longlinecharters.com, your phone number is on there, and they can give you a call directly. Yep, and Facebook, Instagram, it's all got it on there too. So. All right, Eric. Sounds good. Appreciate your time. Good fishing to you, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Yep. Have a good day. All right, Eric Long of Longline Charters. The website longlinecharters.com, longlinecharters.com. As he mentioned, they're also very active. On Facebook and Instagram, I think I've seen them on YouTube as well, longlinecharters.com. At Lake St. Clair, it's, it's, a, it's a unique fishery. It is an urban fishery, as he mentioned. If you try to go out there in the summertime on certain days, especially the weekend, <laughs> it's a whole different ball game. We'll take a break here on the Outdoor Magazine Show. When we come back, Joe Dewan of MUCC. Talking about their AmeriCorps program. Now, I'm a little bit confused. I, I don't know what to expect here. I don't know the details on this. But you know what? We will, after the break, find out more about that. And then we'll wrap up the hour with this week's Ask Avery segment. What do you tip a charter captain or a fishing guide? What's acceptable? Well, we'll find out that in hour number two of Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Sheboygan on Big Country Gold, WCBY, AM and FM. That's 1240 AM, 100.7 FM. And you can hear us in Flint on Sports Extra 1330 WTRX. This segment of Outdoor Magazine uh, brought to you by Rapid River Knives. I have a Rapid River knife in my pocket right now, as I do all the time. Uh, handmade pieces of art that are designed to be used, made in Rapid River by craftsmen. In fact, uh, last week here, Wednesday night, Wednesday Night Live, we did a Wednesday Night Live from the Rapid River showroom 
with Chris Durson of Rapid River. Uh, uh, Nick Grillo of Michigan Brand was along with us. And we gave away a couple of Rapid River knives. If you weren't lucky enough to win one of those, I would encourage you to go to the website, rapidriverknifeworks.com. That's rapidriverknifeworks.com to see what's available um, and, and check them out for yourself. Get one for yourself. Like I say, I have one in my pocket all of the time, and it's honestly the best knife I have ever used, and I find several reasons a day to use it. So far, I have not used it to dress a deer, field dress a deer, gut a deer, but I'm hoping to have that opportunity very, very soon. RapidRiverKnifeWorks.com is the website, RapidRiverKnifeWorks.com. While you are uh, online, head on over to MUCC.org. That's the website of the Michigan United Conservation Clubs. A reminder, if you want to save 25% on your membership, use the promo code MIKE, all caps, M-I-K-E, and you can save a few bucks. Joe Dewan is with us this time around. Joe, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well, Mike. How are you? I am great. Uh, AmeriCorps, tell me about that. Yeah, um, so my name is Joe DeWan. I'm the uh, Huron Pines AmeriCorps member with Michigan uh, Conservation Clubs. And AmeriCorps, like Peace Corps, is a branch of national service. So the Huron Pines AmeriCorps program is a state and national program um, where there are members all across Michigan serving in conservation-focused positions with Groups like the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, the Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and a variety of land conservancies and conservation districts. Okay, so I'm trying to figure. So, so is this um, an activity primarily for young people who do it for a, a, a short period of time? Or what are the logistics on this, Joe? Um, so, yeah, uh, the Huron Pines program specifically, members serve ten months terms, and and generally. It's made up of college of folks that are just out of college, um, looking to get sort of that uh, first opportunity to be working in the field. Um, but there are, uh, on a national level, there are AmeriCorps programs for folks of all ages. But specifically here on Pines is uh, looking for folks that are just out of college. Gotcha. A, a good way to get some experience and help break into the field. Mm-hmm, definitely. And I've learned a lot from my two. This has been my second term of service with Michigan United Conservation Clubs. So what exactly do you do? Um, so as, as you know, uh, the four pillars of MUCC are advocacy, uh, communication, uh, education, and, and habitat. And I really, uh, my service has been focused in the, on those last two pillars, the education and the habitat work that MUCC does. So um, the primary work, primary work that I do is with our field programs, the On the Water Aquatic Habitat Improvement Program and the On the Ground Improvement, uh, Terrestrial Habitat Improvement Program. On the ground, I'm very familiar with. I was thinking uh, on the water was on a little bit of a hiatus. It has been. Um, the original grant that funded it ran out in 2019, but uh, there was a couple some funding this year from the Fish America Foundation. We were able to do um, three uh, on the water events in 2021, but uh, it's back on a, a bit of a hiatus. Oh, but okay. yeah, on the ground has been the primary focus for the last uh, couple months for me. Yeah, well, and On the Ground is such a great program because it allows people to to get involved, get their hands, well, as dirty as they want to, in projects that make a direct impact. That You can see the good that you've done through the On the Ground program. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have, the best days of my AmeriCorps service have always been out in the field with volunteers doing the On the Ground projects. Uh, over, just over the last uh, five weeks, we've been all across the state um, planting trees, um, doing some prairie restoration projects, and we were even planting. Uh, we planted about 900 wildflowers with the Nature Conservancy just a couple weeks ago in Monroe County. So, doing those hands-on projects are great. So, Joe, how does somebody get involved in the AmeriCorps project uh, program? Um, so, yeah, actually, they're hiring about 22 positions for for next year. Um, if folks were to go to huronpines.org slash AmeriCorps, they would see all, all the listed positions and um, uh, instructions about how to go about applying for them. It's uh, filling out an application and submitting a cover letter and resume to the, the program coordinator. Um, but yeah, those positions will be open for at least another week or so. Oh, I didn't know these were paid positions. Excellent. huronpines.org slash AmeriCorps? Mm-hmm. And what's, uh, how much longer do you have in this, uh, in this program, Joe? Um, I, so, yeah, I started my service in February of 2020, and I will be actually ending just about a month from today on November 19th. So what's the ultimate goal for you? Where do you want to end up in life eventually? 
Oh, that's that's a, that's a great question. Um, I really have gotten to enjoy learning a lot about the natural resources of Michigan through my time in the Huron Pines program, and I really just kind of want to continue growing and, and learning about everything that there's so much to do here. Um, there's and there's so much work to be done in the natural resources world. So um, I'm going to try and find another uh, position with a with a good organization and keep on uh, keep on learning and keep on get, uh, the AmeriCorps motto. Um, is get things done, and so I'm going to try and keep getting things done. Uh, I like that. Well, good luck to you, Joe. I'm sure you'll be very successful. Get things done. I like that. HuronPines.org slash AmeriCorps. Um, and if you want to learn more about MUCC, the website MUCC.org, MUCC.org. Use the promo code MIKE, all caps, and save 25%. Good luck to you, Joe. Dewan, appreciate your time. We'll take a break here on the Outdoor Magazine Show. When we come back, this week's Ask Avery segment a question people all uh, um, often ask me. It's like, what's the appropriate tip for a charter captain or a fishing guide? Well, there is no hard and fast answer, but I have some thoughts in this week's Ask Avery segment. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Houghton Lake on 98.5 WUPS. And you can hear us in Holland on WHTC AM and FM, 1450 AM, 99.7 FM. The Ask Avery segment is brought to you each week by my good friends from Security Credit Union. Security Credit Union loves to work with outdoorsmen and women, and they can help you with your next outdoor adventure. Check them out online at securitycu.org. That's securitycu.org. The way the Ask Avery segment works is this is your chance to get involved in the content uh, of the show. You can ask me a question directly, or you can uh, send me a question that you would like me to pass along to somebody else, maybe in the DNR or MUCC or somebody that you might not have access to that that possibly I do. Uh, The best way, in my opinion, to get these questions to me is to send me an email, mike at mikeavoryoutdoors.com. That's mike at mikeavoryoutdoors.com. You can try hitting me up on the messaging platforms or the the messaging options of the social media platforms, but there's just so darn many of them these days, it's kind of of hard to keep track of. So uh, mike at mikeavoryoutdoors.com. This week's question is I can't contribute it or attribute it to just one person because I I hear from several people uh, asking this question several times a year. But the the gist of the question is, what is the appropriate tip for a a charter captain, a fishing guide, or a hunting guide? Um, When you go on these adventures, say if you hire a, hire a charter captain or a fishing guide, you, you pay for that service. You know what that's going to cost you going in. You know, whether it's two, four, six hundred dollars or whatever, depending on, you know, big boat, big Lake Michigan trip, how many people are on the boat. But it is, I don't want to say it's expected, but it is completely acceptable to then tip the captain and maybe the first mate. The same thing with a fish, a, a hunting trip. If you go on a, with a paid outfitter, you're going you're gonna to be charged a certain amount, and that amount will be, in some cases, uh, just for the hunt itself. Maybe it also includes lodging. Maybe it includes meals. And those are all factors in how much is included. In general, and this is just a guideline, I like to start at about 15%. Uh, 15% for a basic service if you got what you paid for. And then if the trip was above and beyond that, whether hunting or fishing, I like to tip accordingly. Now, people say, well, what if I tip too little? Will the, will the, will the guide be offended? I don't know if they're ever, uh, ever going to be offended. I mean, if you pay $500 for a fishing trip and you give the guy a $20 tip, well, yeah, that might be, that might be a little much. But I think most hunting or fishing guides realize that the tip is going to be based on a couple of things, how the trip went. And that doesn't mean how successful it was. It doesn't mean did you catch a boatload of fish or shoot a big buck. It means did that outfitter or captain do what they could to help you be more comfortable and enjoyable. 
Uh, regarding first mates, I think it's appropriate to tip a first mate because that first mate oftentimes is the one who's really doing the bulk of the work. Yeah, the captain is taking you to the lo- location. He has the guy. He has the the money into the operation. He's paying for the boat. He's paying for the fuel. But oftentimes, it's that first mate who's at the back of the boat who's really doing the bulk of the work for you. I think it is completely appropriate and 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 a great idea to tip a first mate if there is a first mate on the boat. Again, how much you want to tip them? Uh, that's a little more subjective. Again, I like I like to start at fifteen percent, maybe go to twenty percent, maybe even twenty five percent on a on a guide or an outfitter. But the first mate, you know, depends on what kind of a job they did for you. On a hunting trip, a hunting outfitter, if you are receiving more than just the hunt, if you're getting room and board and meals, then I think it's appropriate to tip a little bit more. Do you tip the cook if there is a separate cook in camp? I think so. I think if you enjoyed your meals and there's somebody there specifically just to cook for you, I think they deserve a little bit uh, a, a little bit as well. Now, you might say, man, this is all starting to build up. This is all starting to get pretty expensive. I, I, I get that. I get that. But I think people deserve to be compensated for what they've done, especially, especially in today's world when so many people choose not to work, when they choose just to stay home and not get a paycheck, not go out and, and, and work for their money. So the people who are showing up, the people who are working for you, and showing you a good time, I think they deserve a little something for that. Final question on this is, well, what if I tip them with something other than money? Uh, that's an option. I mean, geez, if you give somebody a, a, a very nice hunting rifle, that's a good tip, right? But uh, I like to go with the, with the cash route because then they can do what they want or they can buy really what they need with that money. And I like, I like to tip them in cash, right? I mean, come on. Cash, cash is king, and, and oftentimes cash doesn't <clears throat> go on the books, if you know what I mean. So cash is always a good option. But it's purely personal. I do think it's appropriate to, if you had a good time, if the charter captain or the hunting guide did a good service for you, I think they deserve to be compensated a, a little bit for that. Uh, and thank you to the friends at Security Credit Union for helping to make uh, the each week's Ask Avery segment possible. Check them out online at securitycu.org. at securitycu.org. We'll take a break for the top of the hour. When we come back, you know it's going to be an interesting conversation with Tom Lounsbury right here on Outdoor Magazine. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by J Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polarcraft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Shadow Hunter Blinds, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Yes, indeed, this is the big guy, Mike Avery, and welcome to our number three of this week's Outdoor Magazine show right here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network. Three hours, three hours each week talking about the great outdoors, the history and tradition of the outdoor lifestyle here in the great state of Michigan and occasionally beyond. People say, how do you come up with topics, with subjects, with material to fill three hours every week? I say three hours. I think I could fill three days every week. I mean, you, you look at what we have here in our state, the outdoor recreational opportunities. Uh, we are truly b- blessed, I believe, to live here in, the, in, in Michigan. At least I think I am. I feel like I am. Yeah, it's nice to go to other other places. For example, you know, last week I was down in Ohio hunting with Bill Piles of Ohio Bow Hunting Outfitters, and it was wonderful. Mother Nature didn't cooperate. I mean, it was in the high 80s, low 90s as we were heading out into our stands. You're not going to see a lot of daytime 
uh, whitetail movement in those temps, but it, it, it was nice. It was fun. And it did point out this. Of the 11 hunters, we had uh, two guys who shot nice bucks, and, and the rest of us you know, saw deer but didn't get a shot. It did point out and remind me, although I am very much aware of this, you don't have to have a harvest. You don't have to take an animal to have a wonderful, successful hunt. And that's what uh, certainly the, the anti-hunters, and I, I believe a lot of the non-hunters, don't realize you know, they think in order to, to have it be a good trip, you've got to go out and catch your limit of fish or you've got to go out and sh- shoot a critter. And that's just not the case. The experience is the experience. The experience of getting out there on the water, of getting out there in the woods. Just the act, the act of doing that. Getting away from our day-to-day lives, getting away from the shop, getting away from the office, getting away from the whatever it is that is the daily grind that we have to do to pay our bills, to get outdoors, connect with Mother Nature, match wits with some kind of a critter, uh, deal with what Mother Nature sends our way. That's what it's all about. A A harvest or a limit of fish is just an absolute bonus. And, and I have found, as I get older, I think I become more aware of that. Tom Lounsbury is a, is a fellow old guy. He's been around the outdoor scene here in Michigan for a long, long time, a noted outdoor writer and a hunting expert. And he's with us now on the uh, Outdoor Magazine phone line. Tom, welcome back. How are you? Doing good, Mike. Doing good. And it's... Uh I'm with you. I dearly love living in Michigan. I couldn't think of a better place to be. We got it's just marvelous what we have to offer in this state. Well, and I hope you don't take offense when I call you a fellow old guy. Oh, not at all. Hey, <laughs> a ge- geezer works too. An old geezer. Yeah. Hey, the fact that we're still around says a lot, right there, Tom. Oh, you betcha. You betcha. <laughs> and uh, man, I look forward to each each hunting season. I, you know, Michigan has. You know, just offers, you know, starting with the uh, early goose season, you know, we're, we're going right up to, and then uh, the small game and all that, uh, fall turkey, everything. Oh, it's just what a splendid atmosphere. And, and, and again, if you would, kind of talk a little bit more about this concept of you don't have to take a limit of fish or game to have a great day outdoors. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I One of my most memorable trips was my f- first caribou hunt, in the Arctic, and I actually injured my leg early in the hunt and was hobbling around and never got a caribou. But what a marvelous time being in that country and and, uh, sharing time with the Inuits. And uh, it was just, oh, I'll... I just never forget it. The northern lights, everything, the wolves howling, you know, there, there was all those moments, and I never got a caribou, but yet it's one of my most memorable hunting trips. Yeah, you talk about those northern lights, man. You start getting far up in the north country. I, I, we were on a bear hunting trip one time in Manitoba, and when I saw the northern lights from that angle, from that perspective, it was like, holy cow, this is unbelievable. Oh, just absolutely beautiful. I'll never forget the one night I was uh, in front of the tent sipping on a cup of tea, and the northern lights were flashing all over the mountaintops, and wolves were howling their heads off. <laughs> you can't beat a moment like that. Oh, no, you can't. No, you can't. Um, and as you say, this is uh, such a great time of year. I call it October. I call it Rocktober because all the hunting seasons are open at one time or another during October including your beloved pheasant season. Now, as we are recording this a little bit early this week, the season hasn't started in the lower, but by the time people hear this show, Tom, you're going to have a lot of miles under your boots. Oh, you betcha, and it's going to be a good year. Uh, The wild birds had a fantastic year. What was during that early time frame, farmers were having trouble because of drought and all that. It was ideal nesting and, uh, you know, chick-rearing period. And there, and we had a great winter carryover of wild birds. And uh, anyway, I'm really anticipating a, a great season uh, this year. In fact, probably one of the best in many years because all the all the items here in Michigan, you got to have a lot of things affect a, a good pheasant season. First of all, you want to have a successful, especially first hatch, 
and uh, and and then you want the weather to be cooperative because uh, 90% of the birds you shoot will be uh, hatched that year. A lot of people think they're older, and uh, but anyway, uh, it's uh, it's been ideal for the birds this year. And if the cover is there, they're going to be there, and it's going to get real interesting with these late rains that we've had. My prairie grass is overhead high, so it's going to be interesting <laughs> n- uh, getting these birds narrowed down, and they aren't dummies at all. How in the world do you hunt a, cr- a critter like a, like a pheasant in cover that's over your head? You've got to have good dogs and a strategy. Sometimes it's blind luck, but anyway, yeah, I, I always try to put a strategy out there, but one of my key rules is, uh, you know, we'll set up a certain design, but the dogs dictate. If they get on the birds, then you follow the dogs. Go with the dogs. You must have to push the birds to the end of the cover, because there's nowhere you, no way you can get a shot on a bird in, 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 in grass that high, can you? Well, yeah, if they, you know, they, they'll flush straight up and you can get a shot. But in that kind of cover, uh, without a dog, getting them to go up is near impossible. And to find them after they go down is near impossible. You can mark those birds coming down, but uh, once they drop to a certain level, uh, you, you can't see. And anyway, it pays to have good dogs. I, I look at pheasant hunting today for the wild birds. Uh, is like trying to climb a, if you don't have a dog, it's like trying to climb a ladder without rungs. That's an old saying I've long used. And, uh, mm. and you need a good dog. Like when you and I were kids, we could walk out in the orchard, shoot a couple of birds. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. Uh, they, they, the wild birds have evolved into something else. And when I first started putting my cover on, on the farm, I actually could kill more birds with marginal cover. But now that I got over a, 100 acres of a solid block of cover, oh, man, they run circles around you. Did you plant that prairie grass or did it come back on its own? I planted it. And uh, it's, it's a patient process. It doesn't grow like your cold season grasses. The warm season prairie grasses take a while to set the roots down deep. And in the first three years, you don't think anything's happening. And then all of a sudden, boom. But within four to five years, you've got, oh, just dense, you know, luxuriant cover. Whitetails love it. I'll tell you right now, you want some good whitetail ground, put in some prairie grass and, and be patient and allow it to grow because whitetails absolutely love it as well. I'm assuming since you planted this, it must be native to Michigan? Yes, native to, yes. Actually, there were uh, some prairies in my thumb area, like near Unionville, and then there's some over by Saginaw and that were natural prairies. And yes, it's uh, it's all native grasses. Uh, uh, what is really tall in my fields right now, and I notice different species. I got like uh, four species of grasses, and and uh, one species will take over depending on how the weather is that year. Well, this year it's big blue stem, which is just oh, it's just you know tremendous cover. I have what's called a filter strip on my ditch. It's a hundred foot wide strip off each side of the ditch, and that's solid switchgrass. That is really nasty stuff. Uh, you get after a pheasant and that, it's just even hard to walk through, much less, you know, try to get the mm. birds up. So is, is your farm at the point now where it's all self-sustaining, or do you still have to go in and tweak the habitat once in a while? Oh, tweaking a habitat is a continuous process. I, I have uh, uh, my fields on a rotation. I got it divided up into three blocks, and I'll do one field uh, one year, and then, you know, and I try to space it out. I'll, I'll either have it uh, mowed right down, or what's really good in the natural process is to have a controlled burn. And, man, that's something when you uh, have, like, a 40-acre field and the flames are coming up, and it's a traffic stopper. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and always hire, I always hire a professional to uh, do my control burn. So. Uh, I was going to say, uh, that's that's got to be a nerve-wracking uh, experience. But if you got somebody else doing it who does it for a living, that would be all the difference. Oh, absolutely. And uh, they had, like, a water truck ready uh, teams and uh, yeah. and the first time I watched it I was really nervous I thought it was a little windy <laughs> but uh, man they did it really good and they, they get the ring of fire going and the fire will come together and when it joins in the middle uh, it'll turn it into a real fiery tall tornado of flames and then poof it goes out everything uh. That sounds cool. Listen, Tom, hang tight. We've got to take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine Show. We're talking with Tom Lounsbury. You know Tom. 
noted uh, outdoorsman, outdoor writer, and uh, hunting expert here in the great state of Michigan. Uh, lives on a wonderful family farm in the Thumb. More coming up right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Houghton Lake on the Twister 92.1 WTWS. Uh, And you can hear us in Newbury on WNBY 1450 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Reader Landscaping. It's your nature and our nurture. Let Reader create an outdoor getaway in your backyard. Let them... Clean up your property for the fall. I, the folks at Reader, a crew has been over to my place. We had them put in a water feature, and it had developed a little bit of a leak. I mean, things do that. And they came over, and they completely tore that thing down almost to the ground. They found the problem. They fixed it and rebuilt it. Cannot ask for anything more. Uh, they're coming back to do some tree trimming here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, they've done all the fertilization and stuff to get us ready for the fall. Uh, just a great company, great people. And, uh, you know, you want to get the most out of your lawn and property, right? Reader can help you do that. Check them out online at ReaderLandscaping.com. That's R-E-D-E-R, ReaderLandscaping.com. Talking out with Tom Lounsbury, noted outdoorsman, outdoor writer, uh, hunting expert. And, and, Tom, I want to talk a little bit more about your farm. I mean, this is a family farm that's been in your family for, geez, how many years now? Well, uh, my grandfather started on it in 1883, my great-grandfather, wow. and uh, I'm fourth generation, uh, you know, handling it, and uh, it was for the longest time, uh, especially with my grandfather and my father, it was intensively farmed, but since I've taken over the farm, I've, uh, uh, yeah, I have 167 acres, only 60 are still used for crops. All the rest is in the you know conservation programs, which entails I have evergreen windbreak or shelter belts around the you know the perimeters, and then everything is uh, prairie gas and wildflowers. I just think what a what a what a wonderful blessing that is to have number one to have that kind of ground, but to have this connection with your family history through this piece of property. That's very special. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm I'm very proud of it. It. Uh, I'm not sure my late father would appreciate, uh, you know, he put more into tiling the farm than he paid his parents for it. <laughs> and then, then I come along and I got it all in the prairie grass. And, of course, he hated seeing trees near farmland. So this would not be his cup of tea. But he had his time. I'm having mine. And it's just wonderful to walk out the door and be it's right there. Uh, yeah, farming practices. I mean, back then they 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 wanted to get every square foot into production that they possibly could, and I don't blame them. I mean, you got to do what you got to do at, during the time that you're that you're in. That's right. And if I was a farmer, uh, you know, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. But I I I, I have I have a farming background, but I'm just loving sitting back and watching things go the way I have them going, and, and it's just wonderful. But uh, And that was when we're talking the intensive farming. That was one of the downfalls with the pheasant in Michigan, uh, especially combined with some rough winters, was all of a sudden farming techniques changed. And then you saw herbicides and insecticides being used. And when you and I were ki- uh, kids, cornfield pheasants could hide in them because, you know, they had their share of weeds and yeah. that. But now they're pristine, clean. Uh, there, there's no cover other than the corn stalks, and uh, and uh, and then insecticides. Uh, you know, one of the most important things for young chicks is 99 percent of their diet is insect protein while they're growing up. And if you don't have the insects in the grass, uh, you know the hens aren't going to be able to you know have a good survivability with their chicks. And that's the one thing about where I have, there's no insecticides, herbicides, or all this. It's just uh, all natural. Uh, butterflies, oh my goodness, lots of butterflies and everything. I tell you, things are going good. Do you not allow uh, spraying on your property then? Uh, only on my food plots. Hmm. I have a couple food plots, and I do it one time. I do use a Roundup uh, on it one time, and then uh, the rest is, uh, is uh, you know, no spraying, no. So. Have you been out uh, deer hunting at all much? Yes, and it's a good year. I get serious 
when Halloween rolls around. One of my favorite techniques to hunt bucks, especially, is using deer vocalizations. And I can tell you right now, uh, the bucks are starting to get frisky. Uh, Doe and bleat cans will start working now, but I like to do a setup and uh, I, I use what I call my Marlena. A lot of you, the listeners probably don't know who Marlena Diedrich was, but that uh, uh, German actress that was a singer too back in the 1930s on uh, black and white movies. I call my doe call the Marlena Diedrich doe <laughs> call, and I put out a long, deep call. And then I love throwing in tending young punk bucks. I call it a young punk buck. Uh, you know, tending grunts right out there. Mm-hmm. And oh, and when the deer respond, does it work all the time? Absolutely not. But when it works, what a thrill. Well, you, you talk about they're starting to get revved up. My granddaughter, Addison, my 15 year old granddaughter, shot a buck last night. Beautiful eight point. He's all oh. rutted up. His neck is big. His tarsals oh, yeah. are smelly. I mean, yeah, they're they're starting to think about getting going. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Their necks are. I've been seeing them. Their necks have all swollen. They're all swollen up. It's going right in there. Typically, the peak will hit mid November, but uh, when Halloween approaches, actually from the latter part of October, you know, I always say Halloween is a nice key time frame. Uh, boy, you know, what's really nice about that just prior to the firearm season is the bucks are really frisky, but not all the does are. And that's when it can be when you send out the call that you're a doe looking for a date, that's when it can work the best. Isn't that interesting, this whole concept of vocalization and scents and mock scrapes and stuff? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, y- yeah. Y- years ago, that, that wasn't a factor. That's something that only, has only developed fairly recently. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing the vocalizations, got into it, boy, time flies, but I'm doing it for pretty close to 30 years. Really? And it was really? just in the new stages then. And uh, and I'm always continually learning something new. It's a never-ending process, but uh, but what a thrill, when, when, like when the rut's on, when a buck comes in and he's mad, his ears will be flat on his skull, his hair on his back will be standing up, and his tail is sticking straight out, and he's ready for a scrap. And, and there's nothing more thrilling to see than that, especially when you can line up on shooting. <laughs> especially when you got him in your sights. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do, do, do you use rattling here in Michigan at all? You, uh, you know, rattling does work on occasion. My problem with rattling is that they tend to, uh, the bucks will circle a rattling sequence, uh, and I, I've noticed that. Uh, and I think they're trying to see who's fighting who, and then how, and try to scent the doe and try to slip in and get the doe. Uh, whereas with the vocalizations, I've had them come, you know, come right in, right, right in, just beautiful. Are you still using your beloved uh, Thompson Centers? Yes, I I love my Thompson Centers and. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, it, and actually, I heard a rumor that uh, that uh, Smith and Wesson is dropping the line and everything else. So Thompson Centers might be a collector's item. Well, if so, you're going to be in good shape because I think you got a pretty good collection of those things out there. Oh, I, I love my I love my contenders. <laughs> I, sure, I really do. Um, but you're using them. I mean, for small game, you're using them for deer, or just about everything, aren't you? Oh yeah, yeah. I use them all. I got different barrels. And use the same frame. I got a couple frames. One's a G2 frame, the newer contender type frame. And then I do love my old uh, contender frame that has the Cougar lasered onto the side of the, the you know, the receiver. But uh, anyway, I just love them all. Very, very effective, very light to use. Uh, my one grandson for the youth hunt was using my uh, contender with a 44 Magnum barrel and a red dot sight, and he just loves it. Uh, as much as I love bow hunting, I am fascinated by that platform of a, of a TC, a contender, an encore, whatever. You know, a single shot, so it's not like uh, it's not like you got a semi-auto or even a bolt action nope. in your hands. Nope, it's it's one shot count. See, I have both pistol barrels, and then I have uh, what I use a lot of are the, the carbine and rifle barrel system, and I, and just by moving a, a couple pins and, and so forth, you can change the whole platform. And a beauty I like about them is, in, you know, when you are you have to cross a fence or you want to get up in a tree and, and pull it up, it's so easy and quiet to load and unload. What makes it a carbine? Is it the length of the barrel? Yes, yes. 
Uh, you know, I call anything uh, 20 inches and under basically a carbine, and anything over that's a rifle. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, by the time folks hear this show, you will have been in the pheasant fields. You say you're expecting a good season. What dogs are going to be out there with you this year, Tom? Uh, a mixture of labs, setters, Britneys, and even one of my mountain curs. Uh, it's going to be a regular circus out there. I, uh, I like the idea of pointing dogs are really good at narrowing the things down, but boy, uh, to really get those birds to flush up, you can't beat a Labrador retriever, you know, homing in and putting them up. And and a lot of these guys, there's people out there, I've had people show up with their pointing dogs that are kind of alarmed that I have, I'm have. i allowing, a, a, you know, a flushing dog to be along. But <laughs> I learned that technique of hunting from uh, hunters that, when I was a kid, used to come up from Detroit, and they were originally from down south. These were World War II veterans that went to the auto industry to get a job, and they knew dogs, and they knew uh, guns, and and with what they used, and I, I'm pretty sure, was a technique they used on quail, which was the pointing dogs would find them, the flushing dogs would put them up. And I found out that works beautiful for wild birds that actually don't hold for a point anymore. And they also don't cackle when they flush. Oh, I would uh, miss that so much. That was that was one of the best parts of the whole thing when a rooster oh. would take off and cackle. Oh, I mean, that's, you know, not, there, there's nothing like a nice crispy fall morning and a rooster cackling up. And I, I, I always love that smell of fresh burnt gunpowder on a frosty, frosty breeze. <laughs> if your hunting buddies didn't like it when, uh, when you have flushing dogs, they must go. Uh, they must get really upset when they see a cur. Well, <laughs> the cur that really just sends them inside like, out. Yeah, yeah, she's a mountain cur, and she. Uh, I, I have to work on her on the retrieving thing. We sometimes have a discussion as to who owns what got just down. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, she she's a flusher. She goes right in there, and uh, and uh, and uh, every now and then she'll let out a howl. I've used beagles. I just lost my beagle. One of my best bird dogs uh, in with the with the pointers was an old beagle I had, and and he knew when he was hunting pheasants, and he knew when he was hunting rabbits, and he'd get right in there. And you couldn't beat it. Ah, it's it, wonderful. I love hearing your stories, uh, Tom. And uh, I wish you nothing but the best the rest of this season. And uh, let's stay in touch because you're a very interesting guy to talk with, and I appreciate your time. Well, and it's always a pleasure, Mike. It truly is. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Lounsbury, noted outdoor writer, hunting expert, a land management expert from the thumb, uh, on the family farm, which I think is so very cool, and the transition he's made from a from a working farm to a to a wildlife mecca is very interesting and very impressive. We'll take a break here on the Outdoor Magazine Show. A few more thoughts as we get ready to wrap up this week uh, this week's show. Uh, once again, with wild game chef extraordinaire Dave Miner, right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Ludington on News 97, 98, 98.7 WLDN. We're going to stay on the west coast of Michigan here for a minute. You can hear us in Manistee and WMLQ 97.7 FM. How about Muskegon, WKBZ 1090 AM. And while we're at it, let's go down the coastline to St. Joe, WSJM 94.9 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Wilds Plumbing and Heating. Their motto, their slogan is whatever it takes. I love working with a company that has that mindset. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to get the job done. Whatever it takes to satisfy the customer, the folks from Wilds, will take care of it. They've helped me out at two different houses now, many, many different jobs. They've done a great job every time, as I, as I know they will for you as well. I uh, I welcome them into my house. I would not suggest that you do the same if I wasn't completely satisfied and happy with their work. Check them out online at wildsplumbingandheating.com. That's wildsplumbingandheating.com. And don't be surprised if one of the guys walks into your house and if he sees some fish or deer heads or something mounted on the wall, he strikes up a conversation because a lot of their guys are avid, hardcore hunters and anglers as well. 
Uh, I always enjoy my conversations with Tom Lounsbury. He's just a very, very interesting guy. Uh, so much knowledge, a wealth of experience, and a great storyteller. And that's what makes him a great guest here on the show. Let me see what else is going on. Um, oh, um, if you've been with me for a couple of years, you know that there are some causes that I believe very strongly in. And one of them is the Real Men Wear Pink campaign to uh, raise awareness and to fight breast cancer. My mom has had breast cancer twice. My sister-in-law has had breast cancer. And I lost a niece who left behind a young family. Uh, to breast cancer. So I, I, I hate it. I hate that disease. Um, and so if there's any small thing I can do in any way to help fight it, I do. Um, and this time around, it's another uh, Real Men Wear Pink auction to do a fishing trip with me, Captain Mike Avery on Saginaw Bay, along with my buddy Jason Wolverton of the Forward Corporation. In fact, Jason will be my first mate. And we're doing this one to help Jason's Real Men Wear Pink campaign. It's an online auction. I would give you the link, but it's, it's kind of long and it's kind of uh, a lot into it. But what I would recommend is if you're on Facebook, head to my Facebook page, and there you will find a link to this online auction where you can make bids. Now, this is legit. This is not a scam thing at all. I wouldn't put my name on it. Uh, you know, I, I would not be involved in something like that. We have done similar auctions before with Jason Marsh. He's a stand-up guy. It's all very secure. Uh, nobody's going to take advantage of you. But if you want to bid on this, uh, you can do so. And then uh, you and uh, me and Jason Wolverton can spend a day on Saginaw Bay, a mutually agreeable day. Next summer, the summer of 2022, on a beautiful 26-foot angler quest, chasing walleye on Saginaw Bay. Now, I can't promise a limit of fish, but when I can, what I can promise is that I will do my best to find you fish, and I think we will have a good time. I, I hear that from people who I take out fishing. You know, you know you, we, we, we enjoy time on the water with you, and, and that's what it's all about. It's like, it's like our trip down to Ohio last week. Only two of 11 of us shot a buck, which is, you know what? I mean, that's, hey, it's free range hunting. I guess I would have only thought maybe three, three people would, would shoot a buck. But it was such a wonderful, enjoyable experience that it didn't matter. And then I come home, and my 15 year old granddaughter, Addison, Addie, shoots a beautiful eight point on some property we have access to. Um, thank you, Gene. Appreciate that. Pam, appreciate that. Uh, in mid-Michigan, central Michigan, she did a great job, great shot. Uh, just, just a bonus. I mean, what, I want her or my grandson Carter or my grandson Trent, I want them to experience the harvest. I want them to be able to shoot deer, to catch fish, because at this point in their outdoor experience, that is important to them because it helps it helps give them something to look forward to it helps them set the bar so they can judge themselves uh, themselves on future outdoor activities i want them to harvest things but when it comes to me i don't care i really don't a harvest is just a bonus the experience is the experience and I would encourage you to get out during this month of Rocktober and take advantage of this experience. By the way, uh, my part of the world, we had our first frost the other night. You have likely had a frost at your place by now. Uh, the whitetail rut, depending on where you live across the state, is starting to kick off. That big buck that Addie shot had a big swollen neck on it, and its tarsals were uh, very odiferous. So, you know, he's, he's getting going here. Uh, what else? Uh, one more time. Uh, condolences to everybody at the Killer Food Plots family at the passing, the untimely passing of uh, company owner, president, and uh, front man, the face of Killer Food Plots, Nick Percy. Um, died from complications of COVID at just 50 years old. Nick, really a great guy. 
Um, I was blessed to work with him, blessed to be able to call him a friend, and his loss is uh, is felt very deeply. Uh, prayers to his fiance Tracy, and everybody at the Killer Food Plots family. Uh, he was a good Christian man. He's in a better place, but he is uh, very much missed here in this world. We'll take a break. Uh, when we come back, we'll wrap it all up with Wild Game Chef Extraordinaire Dave Miner. And I think, if I remember right, he has a pheasant recipe, but we will know more coming up after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the show on more than two dozen AM and FM stations across the great state of Michigan, uh, Michigan, including WSGW in Saginaw. That's AM and FM, 790 AM, 100.5 FM. I'm actually in the studios of WSGW right now. Although for this three hours, this one corner of the building is uh, officially or unofficially called the Outdoor Magazine Studio. I'm in here with Pat Johnston doing a wonderful job as always. Pat, I do certainly uh, appreciate that. Also appreciate my good friend and uh, wild game expert, Chef Dave Miner, joining me uh, almost every week. And guess what? He's here once again. David, welcome back. How you doing, Michael? I am. Uh, I'm great, Dave. I'm, I'm, I'm great. And you, you sound good, too. I'm glad to hear that. I'm feeling a lot better. Things are healed up real nice for me, and I'm good. Good, good. Glad to hear that. Glad to hear that. Now, listen, I was just talking to Tom Lounsbury. You know Tom. Uh, yes, he's a hardcore good. pheasant hunter. So uh, in honor of Tom, I think you've got a pheasant recipe, don't you? I sure do. When we did the uh, VFW out in Chero, we spoke a lot about hunting. <laughs> he's a great guy. Oh, he is, yeah. Anyway. I've got a pheasant cordon bleu recipe that the wow factor is just over the top, okay? It sounds fancy. It is. So what you want to do is it's going to take one to two breasts per person. Hi. I'm on the radio. You guys got to be quiet now. The little boys are up here ready to hunt. So, okay. That's all Thank right. You. They're come up to hunt. <laughs> so anyway, you need one to two breasts per person about six ounces of a very good smoked ham, like a Westphalian or something, other than just like a boiled ham. And you need some nice Swiss cheese, uh, probably about six ounces of that, because we're going to be doing four portions of this. Two beaten up eggs with a little bit of milk in it, about a cup or so of flour, and a couple of cups of dry breadcrumbs. You can make your own or buy them. And you need some olive oil or just vegetable oil to uh, cook this in. And then we're going to make a sauce. You're going to need one to one and a half jars of beef gravy, or you can make your own, two to three ounces of heavy cream. And if you make the garlic butter like we've had, uh, talked about that a lot, you'd use uh, two or three tablespoons, or you could use two to three cloves of garlic chopped up fine and then some fresh butter. So we're going to make sure you get all of the shot cleaned up, any bloodied meat, get that all trimmed away, and then take, the uh, pheasant breast, put it between saran wrap. You could use a bread bag or, or something of that nature that's a little heavier. And um, pound it down nice and thin. So if you're gonna, actually you could put the two together side by side, and then you could actually take your meat mallet and work it out so that it's going to be big enough. Take the uh, Swiss cheese. Cut, if you're getting slices already, cut them in half. Take and fold up that nicely thin ham and make a packet of about an ounce and a half or so of cheese and an ounce and a half of the ham. So in one corner near the side, you're going to start with rolling it over, and then uh, you're going to fold it. So you're going to make a real nice package of meat with the ham and cheese in the inside of it. So you know, kind of want to make sure that you pounded it out enough so that it seals it. Flour, egg, crumbs, put it in a saute pan with about a quarter inch of um, oil. And then you're going to brown it on all sides. You can take a tongs and hold them and get them all nicely browned. In a pan large enough to hold all of these uh, packages, get the oil nice and hot. Not too hot because what's going to happen is you'll burn them breadcrumbs and you don't want to do that. Brown everything all off real good. 
take the uh, beef gravy, the heavy cream, the garlic butter, the fresh butter, or the chopped up garlic, bring that up to a boil, place the uh, packages of meat in there, and bake them 350 degrees. Oh, it's going to take a good 15 minutes. When you start to see the cheese melting and kind of coming out, oozing out, you know, it's pretty well done. Or you can take a meat thermometer and stick in there. Make sure it's about 175 degrees or so. But if the cheese is coming out already, it's pretty well done. So you're going to take some rice. Probably should have had six. I should have mentioned that. Six to seven cups of cooked rice. Divide the rice on the plate. Put the Gordon Blue Pack on top. And then you can uh, spoon some of the sauce over the top. I, like I said, the wow factor is just mm. killer. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah. just the um, the name itself just sounds very impressive, very fancy. It is. And, you know, we used to make this quite often. Uh, we used to do the Pheasant Royale. We did Pheasant oh, yeah. Parmesan. Yeah. We did a lot of things. When we had enough help, and you know, we could do things like that. Right now, we're kind of shy on help, so I really have a hard time just trying to keep up with the amount of business we have. Are you still looking for help, Dave? You looking for people? Absolutely. Please, somebody, come and give me a break. <laughs> I'm wore out. I need a good chef. We pay great. Hours are good. You know, you don't never work past 10 o'clock at night. So somebody, please come and help me. Help, help Dave Miner. All right, my friend. <laughs> Listen, I'll let you get on uh, fishing with the kids. Have fun. Oh, boy. Fishing and getting ready for hunting. There you go. Wild Game Chef extraordinaire Dave Miner, a big part of the Outdoor Magazine show, as are you, because if you weren't listening, there'd be no reason to do the show, and I would be very, very sad because I'd have to go out and get some kind of a job. Not ready to retire yet, so I'd have to go out and get some kind of a job. So the fact that you're here listening to the show, listening to the podcast, following me on social media, I do appreciate it. Uh, we're going to wrap up here. going to record an Angler Quest podcast and a Shadow Hunter Blinds podcast. You can always reach me online. And if you want to send me an email, the email address is mike at mikeavoryoutdoors.com. Mike at mikeavoryoutdoors.com.